Amen. I do. And I'm sure many, many, many of you do tonight. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. And verse number 42. Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 42. And keep in mind that when you're reading the gospel of Matthew, you're reading the gospel that bears upon the kingdom of heaven far more than any other book in the Bible. And so therefore, he comes first to the Jews. He sends his disciples out to the Jews. Go not in the way of the Gentiles, nor into the cities of the Samaritans, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew chapter 12, verse 42. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation, shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Bless this word now, Lord. In thy name I pray. Amen. You all can be seated. Who do you suppose the queen of the south is he's talking about here? Queen of Sheba. Queen of Sheba. And she was overwhelmed with the service of his, uh, of his servants and the wealth and the riches and the honor and the wisdom of Solomon. She literally was overwhelmed with it. Now there is a tradition that uh, the Queen of Sheba went back to uh, Ethiopia or in that area, which is Sheba at that time, and uh, bore a son by the name of Menelik. And Menelik later was the one that was given the Ark of the Covenant the Ark of the Covenant, therefore, was hidden somewhere in that land, and therefore, it is in that land to this day. Uh, I don't subscribe to that. No. I believe the, G the Jews know where the Ark of the Covenant is. Anybody does, and they'll know, and they'll keep it there until it's time for it to come forth. But the Bible tells you here in Matthew chapter number 12 that uh, a greater than Solomon is here. Now, these people well knew who Solomon was, he was as well known as David or Abraham or any of the rest of them. Solomon was David's son by Bathsheba. And, of course, you know the story of Bathsheba if you read your Bible. And I'm sure many of you tonight understand what's going on with that. One tried to take the throne from Solomon, but Bathsheba went to David, and David saw for certain that Solomon would reign in his stead. But the Lord Jesus Christ says a greater than Solomon is here. He said some things that could certainly stir up controversy. For example, Matthew chapter 10, verse 15. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That would be controversial. Matthew chapter number 11, verse 23. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day, but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Keep in mind the gospel of the kingdom of heaven is the burden of the gospel of Matthew. And so when you get into the parables of the gospel of Matthew, you'll see that they directly relate to the kingdom of heaven upon this earth. Very powerful things. Keep in mind, these people knew Solomon. In other words, they knew historically who Solomon was. They had great respect for Solomon. No question about that. But the writer of Hebrews, when he wrote about the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter number 11, he didn't mention the name of Solomon one time, not one single time. And that's interesting because it'll make you think, why was he not mentioned? But in any event, the Lord Jesus Christ says, a greater than Solomon is here. Now they said this of Christ. They said he was demon-possessed. Hath we not said thou art a devil and a Samaritan? They said the Lord Jesus was demon-possessed. They said he was illegitimate. In the Talmud, he's called Ben Pantera, the son of a Roman soldier. They said his miracles, the miracles he performed, were satanic deceptions, like Janus and Jambres when they brought forth their serpents back in the book of Exodus. And they said he was a wine-bibber and a glutton accused him of being a friend of sinners. I'm glad he is. Yes, he is. Amen. The Pharisee 2,000 years ago had his own righteousness. This is why the Lord Jesus Christ said, I came not to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. You say, well, they didn't need to repent. Oh, no, 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 no. Listen to the wisdom of God and the word of God. 
He was saying that a righteous man needs no repentance, for he sees no need for repentance. In book of John chapter number 9, he makes it very plain. If I had not come and done the things that I've done before you, you would have no sin. Now listen carefully. But now you say you see, therefore your sin remaineth. He goes to the heart of the issue. He doesn't play with people. He doesn't play with people. You come to the house tonight and say, I don't, need to, I don't need repentance. I don't need forgiveness. I don't need to repent. I don't need any of that. My friend, you're walking in darkness. Well, you say my church thinks mighty highly. I'm glad your church does. You've probably got pens hanging all over the place that they've given you. You're the greatest man in your denomination. But the Bible says plainly in 1 John chapter number 1, if a man says he has no sin, he deceives himself. If a man says he has not sinned, he calls God a liar. And therefore, you must look at the scripture and let it define what's going on. So they said all of these things. But here's what the Lord Jesus Christ said in John 8, 58. He said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Identifying himself with the great I am of the book of Exodus. John 8, 23, he said, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. That's as plain as it can be, folks. His body came from this earth. His soul and his spirit came from above. The soul, once the spirit united with that body, came in there into existence 2,000 years ago. Please don't misunderstand me. The Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, is from everlasting to everlasting. There was never a moment that he did not exist. But the God-man came into being in Bethlehem of Judea 2,000 years ago, these things he said. Now, the occasion of this statement, it's a striking statement, had uh, no doubt they had been thinking this as they looked at the Lord Jesus Christ. They said, well, Solomon was a king's son. He was a king's son. You're a son of a carpenter. Yes, he was on the face of it. But who was his father? The king. Amen. God Almighty. They said Solomon came from Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of peace, the great city of peace. He said, you came from where? Where did he come from? Where was Christ born? Bethlehem of Judea. Yes, he was. Some little small insignificant place about five miles from Jerusalem. They said uh, Solomon was born in a palace. He said, they said, but you've been born in a cow stable and you're greater than Solomon. Solomon had many servants. You got none. You've got none. Look how they're comparing him. Solomon reigned on a throne for 40 years. You have no throne. You've never reigned anywhere. Solomon was, wore kingly robes, and you wear peasants' garb. The Son of Man hath not a place to lay his head. Amen. Solomon drank from gold and vessels. They even weighed the gold that came to Solomon in a year. Rich? Yes, rich beyond measure. Where did his riches come from, though? They came from his father, David. That's where they came from. Solomon had much money, and you're broke. You can't even pay your taxes. You have to call the fish brigade in and get the money from the mouth of a fish to pay your taxes. Don't you think it's quite remarkable that the government is so corrupt that they expect the Son of God to pay taxes? <laughs> Meditate on that for a moment. Think about that one. <laughs> Uh, Solomon drank from gold vessels. He's, they, they, think, they said to themselves, you drink of a harlot. Here's a woman at the well in Samaria, had five husbands. Man she was with at the time wasn't her husband. He said to her, give me to drink. He didn't ask to, for her to give him something to drink necessarily because he was thirsty. He wanted to show her the water of life, and that's what she needed to learn about. Solomon had a lot of money. He was rich. And you don't even have money to pay your taxes with. Solomon had armies. He had no army. He had no army. No army followed him. Solomon built great cities. Yes, he did. He built great cities. And they said, you make chairs, plowshares. You're a carpenter's son. You work in the dirt and you work with the trees. Solomon lived in mansions. You wander about from place to place. An itinerant preacher with no home. Solomon was 13 years in building his own house, you've built nothing. Yeah, that's true. He didn't build any homes on this earth. And Solomon's home's long gone. Amen. 
And the temple that Solomon built no longer stands. Even though it was erected the second time, it's still no temple on the Temple Mount. Solomon had 1,400 chariots, 1,200 horsemen, 40,000 stalls of horses, rode in comfort and splendor, and you walk. You have none of that. How then can you be greater than Solomon? How can you be greater than Solomon? The Bible said, judge not according to the appearance. These are the three powers that drive the earth and it drove the Pharisees. Love of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. All three. There they are. You'll find one element of them in everything that happens among men. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And so it goes. Then how was Jesus greater than Solomon? He was greater because of his birth. God manifested in the flesh. Amen. Amen. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. No, Solomon was born that way. Greater in wisdom. Solomon was wise. As you know the story of the two prostitutes, the decision he made was able to bring true love out. And this is wisdom that God gave Solomon. He deserves to be acknowledged in that wisdom that he had. But the Bible says Christ is the wisdom of God. Amen. And when you think about the wisdom of God being a person, you see everything that had a place, a thing, or something in the Old Testament is all a person in the New Testament. The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. Some churches you go into, they'll teach you how to keep the commandments and do this and do that. And then when you come down to the end, I hope that you're saved and hope that it'll be okay. You better not be heading into eternity on hope. You'd better know who you know and know that you know who you know. I know whom I have believed, he said, and I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Let me tell you something. You may be the, you may be the most well-meaning purpose person in your denomination. You have a clear, pristine record when it comes to crime. You're the most wonderful, benevolent person that anyone's ever met. And yet in all of that, my dear friend, that won't get you one moment in the presence of God. The only way that you can come before him justified as if you've never sinned is through the Lord Jesus Christ, the person of Christ. He was greater as a teacher. Solomon, no doubt, gave us a lesson when I talked about these two prostitutes and one died, his one's babies died. But here's what they said of him, the Lord Jesus. Never a man spake like this man. No, he didn't. He came to the point. He came to the point. He was not, uh, as you would say, ambiguous. He was clear. When he said something, you knew what he was talking about. Never man spake. And beginning at Moses and the prophets, he began to expound to them the things in the scripture. And they said, do not our hearts burn within us. Amen. Amen. My experience has been in preaching and teaching the word of God in churches is that there's a certain element in the church that goes from place to place and all they want is something to make them feel good. That's all they want. They want to stay as shallow as they can be. They don't want to know the Bible. They don't care anything about the Bible. They just want, and there's some places on TV when you listen to their music, they're all story songs about mama, mama's Bible, about the home, about the flower garden, and about this and that and this and that. But there's nothing in there glorifying Christ for what he's done for you. Amen. If we're not here tonight to glorify the Son of God, folks, what's left? Amen. There's nothing left. Uh, he was greater in building, too. Solomon built the temple, built the first temple, and but the Lord Jesus Christ builds people and he builds his church. That's greater than Solomon because upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If good old America shuts the church down, just mosey over to China and you'll find hundreds of millions in China that are true believers in Christ. Amen. And you'll find them all over the world. Africa, Africa has seen revival after revival of the word of God. Millions of believers in Africa, in the Orient, all over the world. I just pray that good old U.S. of A. doesn't fall that far away from God to where it outlaws the preaching of the gospel. And the way they'll do it is they'll try to say that the preacher's preaching hate speech. That's where wokeism was born. Hate speech. Yes, hate speech. And therefore, they, they prosecute, take him out, throw him in jail. Maybe, though, as I've said before, 
when they fill the jails full of the pastors and the evangelists and the missionaries in America, somebody might wake up and say, hold on, hold on. You're letting them loot and steal and burn. You're letting them get away with all of that in California and around the, world, and around the country. And now you're going to take God's man and you're going to throw him in jail? Am I out of bounds with that? No. Not at all. You're not stupid. You see what's happening. Oh, no, 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 no. And it's already worse in Canada than it is here. And we thank God for our Canadian brethren because just a couple of weeks ago we had some folks from Canada. We have people from Canada all the time visit us in this church and we have, we have correspondence, letters from people in Canada that are constantly writing us, amen, and telling us the apostasy in the country. My friend, Jesus was greater than Solomon in his throne. Solomon had a beautiful throne. No question about it. Went up six steps to get up to that throne. Bad problem there. Solomon is associated with the number of six. But you see, the Lord Jesus Christ made the throne of God, the kingdom of God available to every last one of us in this house tonight, born of the spirit of the living God. And the Lord Jesus was greater in prayer, greater in prayer than Solomon. He said this at the tomb of Lazarus. I know you hear me. I know you hear me. Matthew chapter number 6, verse 5 says this. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. After this manner, therefore pray ye. So yesterday morning, about four o'clock, I got up. Some mornings I get up like that. And long before the sun ever came up, I was outside in the dark on the back porch. And this is what I prayed. I prayed this, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Do you pray? Or do you just talk? Do you blast other people? Do you tear them down? Or do you pray? If you'll start talking to God, you'll be amazed at how the Holy Spirit will change your attitude. He'll change your vision. He'll change your life. Christian, you believe what you're supposed to believe tonight? Good. I'm glad. But are you praying? If you're not praying, you're playing. Prayer is your gift and privilege that angels don't have. Cherubim and seraphim do not have that prayer. They can't pray. If they can, show me in the Bible where one of them ever prayed. They can't pray. You know why? They don't have the spiritual makeup you do. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Right now you've made a little lower than the angels, but the day will come when angels are marched before you and you'll judge them. That day's coming. Why? You've been made in the image of God. That means God put something in you that is not in any other creature. Talk to him. I don't know what to pray. Pray that. Pray that. Pray that. Pray that prayer right there. And if you hear a preacher get up in the pulpit and make fun of this prayer, and I've heard him do it before, make fun of it. They say, well, that's just a model prayer. Oh, is it? He should have said, then, let me give you a model prayer. Our Father, which is in heaven. That's not what he said. He said, after this manner, when you pray, pray thusly. And so, our Father, which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's who you're praying to. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's his rightful place. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
These are our needs as we see them. Now let's go a little deeper. The Spirit sees much deeper. Stenazo, stenazo is the Greek word translated sigh. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 2, For in this we groan, stenazo, we sigh, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. I'm going to let the Bible define itself on this. In Romans 8 verses 20 through 22 through 27, the apostle Paul speaks of a triple sign three times, and he calls upon three different groups when he does that. First of all, all of creation, then Christians, and then the spirit. In Romans 8 verse 21, it says, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Have you ever got on YouTube and watched the lions and the tigers as they, as they follow their prey, stalk their prey? Have you ever watched the, the fighting that goes on in the, in the wild world, the wild kingdom? It's survival, folks. Everything on this earth is trying to survive. Survive. Amen. Survive. But the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't tell us to survive. He tells us to abide in him. Amen. He says that the Gentiles work, they scratch, they claw, they do everything they can to get what they need or to get ahead. He says, but your heavenly father knows what you need. He knows everything that you need. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Where do you think the people are coming from at Temple Baptist Church? Where do you think all these visitors came from this morning? These people came from out of town. They came from another state, from places all over the country. Why did they come here? They came here because God moved their soul and their spirit to show them that there's a place still left in America that feeds them, that God is in, that God blesses them, and they can come into this house. And I pray that when they come here that you receive them with open arms. I pray you show them welcome. Because imagine if you were in a foreign Starting to say country. A lot around here is foreign. <laughs> in a foreign state. <laughs> Let's say you're in a different state. We've got people with us tonight that are visitors. They came back for the, for the service tonight. And you're looking for something for your soul and you want to take your family. You want to take your family there because you live in an area where there are no churches preaching the word. It's hard to believe that here in Knoxville, Tennessee with a church on every street corner. But there are places in this country, folks, where there are not churches. Plenty of apostate feel good places, but there's no churches. And so they log in. You see that streaming can be used for pornography. I've been getting on my web, on my, on my emails, I have been, I've been getting pornography sent to me from a lot of it from Eastern Europe, places over there like that. How in the world they got my name to do that? I have no idea. And probably if you told the truth tonight, some of you have been getting it too. So what do you do? I zap it. I zap it. Then I got online. I tried to find some email blockers. I tried to find programs that would stop it before it ever got to my, got to my email. I tried to find it. And it's hard. I, I blocked them. I blo you can go into your email. I use Apple. You can go in there and block these things. I've got a list this long of emails blocked <laughs> but they still get through that makes me wonder if they intend for them to get through it makes me wonder if the uh, powers that be and the money men uh, are, are concerned about corrupting you yeah 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 I didn't ask for this junk you can take a computer you can take my computer your computer some of you may not know this. This is how some people wind up in jail. But you can take your computer, my computer, and anybody, come, you could come in and check my computer anytime you want to. And you'll never find one place on that computer where I am Googling or searching for some pornography or some pervert site. It's not there. It's not there. So I don't fear one thing about it. But the truth of the matter is, if you're doing that, if you're out here and you're getting onto websites like that 
and you're searching out pornography and you're searching out, what was that one called? I forget the, 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 the folks that had 19 children, this one guy, Joshua, he was on some website with free love and all of that. And, and you know, they get into that stuff, but they found it by simply going to his computer, to the cookies, put on his computer, and they knew where he had been surfing. The last murderer, they went to his or her computer and found out, as a woman, how she'd been downloading stuff about how to make this to kill somebody, how to make this to do something, this, that. Stupidity abounds because they don't have a clue that that computer will condemn them. So when you go home tonight and you get on that computer and you start surfing the web, they've got a record of every place you've been. You remember artificial intelligence? They're watching you. Anybody shaking tonight? <laughs> Anybody ready to jump up and run out of here and get rid of that computer? <laughs> you remember the woman who had their email zapped 30-something thousand of them? You remember that one? 30-something thousand emails. She just zapped them. Yeah, who are we talking about? That's right, you all know what I'm talking about. Amen, amen. So what does it mean? Live right and you know you can sleep at night. <laughs> That's what it means. <laughs> amen, amen, <laughs> amen. The creation groaneth. Romans 8, 23, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first, first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. We groan. Now, my body's wore out, okay? And there's, there's, it's it. It's, it's been pumping along for 76 years. In just a few weeks, it'll be 77 years old. It's lasted that long. It's a temporal thing. It's a house. It's this house, the earthly house of our tabernacle. I know it's not going to last forever. I don't know how long... But I, I want it to last as long as God wants me to be here. When he's done with me, he'll take me. And that'll be good for me. That's all I care about is know the Almighty has his hand on my life. And I draw my last breath. It's when he says, that's it, son. It's time to come home. No argument. God calls. I answer. Amen. Amen, amen. amen. That's what happens. You're living in a body. And that's temporal. But you are not temporal. Amen. You're not your body. So we groan within ourselves. But we have the first fruits of the Spirit. You say, preacher, how do I know if I've got the Holy Spirit? You don't. I don't want to be mean with you, but you don't. 27 years I lived like hell. 27 years I was as big an atheist, a godless reprobate. I was everything you should not be. I'm not, I'm not up here tonight to give Satan any glory for anything, but I was as low down and rotten and filthy as they come. And then God came to me. And when God came to me, he awakened me. And when I prayed that prayer on that sofa and raised my head up, somebody came inside me that wasn't in there before. That's the Holy Ghost. And I mean to tell you that he stirred up something. He put a life in me that did not, I didn't know anything about. I had joy flood my soul I could hear what I couldn't hear before. I could see what I couldn't see before. I was hungry for something spiritual. Amen. Amen. We got folks at Temple Baptist Church one hour on Sunday morning. That satisfies. <laughs> then it's back, to the, it's back to the computer and Facebook. <laughs> All your friends on Facebook. I hope you know what a friend is. There are friends on Facebook. But why don't you make them face to face? <laughs> Amen. But in any event, he puts something in me that is sweeter by the day. How many of you know what it is to have the Holy Spirit in you? Amen. The Holy Ghost is in you. That's the earnest, he says here in Romans chapter number 8. The first fruits of the Spirit. The first fruits. That changed life here is God saying that's just the beginning. Because it's going to continue and it's going to be more and more and more. Do you have the Holy Ghost dwelling in you? You say, well, I got saved, but I'm seeking the Holy Ghost. You got messed up somewhere. You may be a good moral person, but you're messed up. He that hath not the Spirit of Christ is none of mine. For by one Spirit are we all baptized in the one body. What? By the Holy Spirit of God. Amen.
And then there's that third groaning, Romans 8 and verse number 26. And that's this, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Have you ever prayed and you couldn't pray? You couldn't find words to express what's moving on inside you. Maybe you're hurt. Maybe you got sorrow. Maybe you're pain. Maybe you see a need, but you don't know how to pray for it. Whatever it might be, you're not left out alone. You're not, in, you're not out here in the lurch. The Holy Ghost is going to make intercession for you. The one that's in you, he's there. He's never going to leave you. And if you've been born again, you know what the Spirit of God is. I've been in prayer sometimes, and I didn't know what to say when I started. So I just got down on my knees. I said, here I am, Lord, and spent some time with God. And something began to move in your soul. He knows what you have need of. You may think you have need of something, but you can't see as deeply as the Holy Ghost can. So the, look what it says about the Holy Spirit. The Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings. It's to not so. Sighing. Now look at this one. John chapter number 11 and verse 33. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the Spirit. Same words, to not so. Now you get the meaning of it? See here, let the Bible define its own meaning. Look at it. He groaned in the Spirit and was troubled. That's what's going on. That's what's happening. That's what's going on. Moved in his spirit. He could feel what she feels. And it moved him. It moved him. This is qualifying him to be your great high priest. Amen. This is him learning something experientially that he did not know. He knows what suffering and pain is. Knew it before he ever made man. But he never felt it until he came into this world and became one of us and walked in our midst. And then God hurt. God suffered. God got hungry. God sweated. God was in pain. God sorrowed. And then God Almighty's Son died on that cross so that we could be saved. He finishes his prayer by saying, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Man said, I heard it said yesterday on TV. All right, you're a Christian. You pray. All right. Now, this is the way Satan likes to work with you. You're a Christian. You pray. All right. Doctor tells you that your son has cancer. And now you have one of two choices to make. Either use medical science as it stands today or pray. So he thought he had him. That's the question. Which one will you do? Will you trust medical science or will you pray? Satan came in Psalm 91. He came and he quoted, He shall give his angels charge over thee, lest thou do what? And so he quoted it in the book of Luke chapter 4. Do you know what the Lord Jesus Christ did when that happened? He said, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Don't ever worry about some pagan judging you for your spiritual relationship with God. Don't ever worry about it. Don't ever worry about it because he doesn't know anything either. Anyway, he knows nothing when some pagan does that. So what do you do, preacher? I turn my child into the hands of God, my little boy who's dying with cancer, whatever it may be, and say, Lord, here is my son. And I'm talking to you about this because you're primary, you're first, you're the one that matters. And if you want to use medical technology to heal this boy, use it. But if you want to heal him outright, you do it. So my trust is in God, but it doesn't mean we can't use medical technology. Now answer that, pagan. There is no answer to it. Do you believe in medical technology? This coming Tuesday morning, I'm going to have a procedure done. I don't look forward to it. It's not going to be fun. But it's something apparently that has to be done. So preacher, who are you trusting? The doctor? No, I'm trusting God. And if he wants to use the doctor 
as a vessel in his hands than using. Or before I ever walk into that room, he may go ahead and take care of this issue before I go in there. And that's what, that's what I preach to people. He heals. He's a healer. He can heal you. I've seen him heal people outright. He can heal you tonight. He can heal me. Or he may choose to go that route. He has his reasons for whatever his reasons may be. There's an awful lot of things the Lord never tells me. <laughs> you all feel the same way. A lot of things the Almighty does and doesn't say a word to me about it. So what do you do? You trust him. That's what you do. You trust him. You trust him. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah said when they were going to be thrown into that furnace, they said whether we live or whether we die, whether we burn or whatever, we will not bow to your God. And so they cast them into the furnace, and that old king came up there shaking and quaking, and he looked into that because he wasn't sure about what to believe or who to believe. He said, did not we cast three into that fire? Yes, Lord. Well, who's the fourth one? <laughs> How'd he get in there? And they said, I see one like the Son of God. Yes. New Bibles don't like it. Bible scholars don't like it. There's no way they could. They say there's no way that that, that that pagan king could have ever known anything about the Son of God. You kidding? He put Nebuchadnezzar on his knees eating grass for seven years till he knew who reigned in kingdoms and in the heart of men. Amen. Oh, yes, he could. Yes, he could. Don't let him. It's like the crowd every year they meet together and they say the real Jesus, the historical Jesus, whatever they call it, Jesus something, this and that and this and that. What they ought to do, just get on their knees and say, Jesus, save me. <laughs> and it'll take care of their meetings. Like the Russian went up, and I told you about this one before. He gets up and looks at this beautiful blue planet. And it is, folks. It's beautiful. How many of you ever seen a photograph? of this beautiful thing out here in space. Now, you and I both know that when you get down to the earth, a lot of that beauty's gone, right? <laughs> Amen. A lot of problems down here. But when you look at it from up there, it's beautiful. Blue. Beautiful thing. And he got up there and he said, I don't see any God. There's no God around here. No God. He's an atheist. There ain't no God. Real smart woman wrote in and said, step outside that thing one time. You'll find out <laughs> there's a God. You better believe it. Take your mask off, open the door, and step into space. You'll meet him. <laughs> Father, bless your word. Thank you for the time together tonight. Bless this dear brother, Father, who's going to be baptized here in a moment. Let the Holy Spirit do his work now. Lord, I'm the messenger. It's all I am. That's all I claim to be. That's all I want. Lord God, that you use me, that you give me an opportunity to stand for you and speak. Thank you for that tonight. Thank you, Lord. And bless now in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand up tonight. What have we got, brother? Sing.